basically from Trav, which is a, in district Pulwama. Uh, I did my schooling here in Srinagar, in a modest school. Uh, and then uh, I went to a SP High Secondary for my uh, 11th and 12th class. And uh, in my 11th and 12th class, I had opted for social sciences right from beginning. Uh, it was a time when there was a tremendous craze for medical and non-medical and in that situation I opted for social sciences uh, which was something very different, uh, very unique and I would always face this, often face this question uh, why you opted for social sciences, was your percentage very low and when people will come to know that no, I had first, first divisions so will be very surprised uh, why he has done this but I had some uh, uh, you know, inclination towards social sciences uh, so after that I did my uh, undergraduation from Amerson College uh, and it was during those days that uh, somehow I uh, developed that inclination towards political science especially. So when it came the time for masters, uh, I had only filed, you know, filled my form for MA in political science to, uh, during the entrance and I got into political science and did my uh, masters there immediately qualified that state eligibility test and then went for MPhil research uh, and it was in 2007 when I was appointed as the assistant professor in the department of political science, same department and I did my PhD after my uh, appointment as, as assistant professor. I started Ampel as I told you in 2005. <clears throat> During that time, this discourse on governance was very, you know, prominent. Uh, people are talking about, especially in the Western countries. Then it had traveled to, to the non-Western countries as well. And actually, governance discourse was being talked about uh, in a different context. Uh, we had moved from a state-centric idea of governance towards more uh, market-oriented liberalization processes happened. There was too much stress on you know, concepts like inclusiveness, uh, 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 transparency, accountability. Uh, and Western countries uh, had invested a lot in, in, in underdeveloped countries in different parts of the world. Uh, and for a long period of time, uh, they treated politics and economy as something different. They argued that perhaps uh, because of the success of Marshall Plan in reconstruction of the Eastern Europe, they believed that the same technology, same issue could be transferred to the non-Western countries and uh, development will come automatically. But gradually they realized that this is a strongly linked with the politics, how politics of the state operates. That determines its development as well. So there this came this idea of good governance, uh, World Bank, IMF, uh, donor agencies, donor countries, they started putting certain benchmarks that you have to do certain things if you want aid. So underdeveloped countries were actually forced to go for it. So you will see from 90s, even in India, liberalization process starting, human rights, uh, uh, you know, in institutions, I mean, you have minority commissions, human rights commission, other commissions and committees being organized. So it was uh, one, there was tremendous failure of governments because, you know, that, that idea that government has to do everything as, as a state, as a, you know, sort of a pattern, pattern which to the citizens uh, and that state will give everything. That idea had failed and it was being argued constantly that state as a as a, a policy implementer essentially has failed. So, so state should concentrate on policy making and getting the ideas from civil society and market. But when it comes to implementation, private agencies, private sector is more efficient, market is more efficient in service delivery uh, aspects. So there was this concept of that governance, now we need to shift from government to governance. And governance essentially was this interaction between market, civil society and the state. Uh, and, and so this idea was very fascinating, it was coming up, very literature was available. Uh, and it was at that point of time that my supervisor was Professor Gulman Ghani. He argued that you should uh, think about on this idea essentially in the context of Jammu and Kashmir state. which. Uh, which uh, which uh, traditionally we have been arguing that Kashmir uh, you know is a political issue which is obviously mm -hmm. has its it has political roots but then you we often use it to learn this from, or listen this from the experts that while it is about political political aspect is very dominant at that's very much at the root cause of it but the way it has been governed 
right from the 47 has added you know what you call as a fuel to the fire or it has impacted the the the, the issue in itself so so there's a uh, you know connect between the political conflict and the governance political conflict might have led to a particular type of governance but that governance the way it has been governed actually did not result in resolving that conflict as in a way it has aggravated that conflict so while the political aspect was being debated at every level, at international level, national level, but this governance was something that was not being talked much about. So that was the beginning of this idea. Then I did my obviously PhD as, as well, strengthened my idea further. And after PhD, I, I completed my PhD. Uh, I, I tried to develop it further, work it for, on it for more than two years again. Then I approached certain uh, publishers, uh, I approached directly to the Oxford because that was something at least that was very much in my, on, on my mind that uh, I'm going to try for a good publisher. Uh, so I waited a long time for this uh, so to, in order to make it somehow comprehensive so that it is acceptable or it, is, it appeals to the publisher. And then I went to the publisher, uh, they liked the idea, uh, then I had to submit my manuscript that manuscript went for, you know, as is a procedure, standard procedure, it went for evaluations, then suggestions came from there, so I had to modify it again. So, it, it, it from my PhD, uh, actually, which I finished it in 2014, April 2014, to its publication, that's in 2019. So, another four years that I worked on it, and finally, the book came out. Yeah, actually, uh, there's a lot of material available, but I could find that it's very scattered and, and we are not using that properly. So uh, that's something that has been happening that people come from outside and they come here and all of a sudden they produce very brilliant books. So this was something that was haunting me that how is it that we live here and we're not able to make use of this material and while as people come from outside, they stay for some time or take back material from here and, and, and they are able to produce good books. Uh, so I, 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 I decided to you know, take a step forward and try to look at it and in the course of time I could see there are a number of good books uh, which have been locally published dealing with certain small issues, certain periods of time and then yes I, there was a tremendous difficulty as far as our maintenance of our archives and other things are, uh, are concerned. That's a very serious issue, it's very unfortunate that our documentation as far as government records, uh, archive and other things are not proper but then uh, somehow I could get you know going again and again and again into it could find certain uh, some archival material certain interviews on the ground and then combine it with the existing material that you already have uh, that's how this whole process went on. As I told you that uh, that essentially the concept of governance is the way it has been talked at the international level or international literature is different. It's, it's more about how state interacts with market, civil society, uh, uh, and, and civil society and government and market interact with each other. Uh, but then obviously every region, uh, every uh, state, every country has its own priorities and its own context in which the governance operates. Uh, when it comes to Jammu and Kashmir state, uh, we still are what we call as the state-centric approach to governance. <clears throat> we are not moved into the market or civil society oriented government. And then obviously, given the context in which uh, the state came into existence and then later on after 47, the whole scenario that emerged after 47, uh, res resulting into the conflict situation which had both national and international dimensions so naturally uh, uh, the, the priority of the state always was you know to bring order in disorder that has been the priority of the state so in this context actually state's role over a period of time has increased rather than decreased so while we may talk at other levels uh, which which essentially is a post 90 discourse obviously that we are moving in the governance but you will find that consistently the state's role in Jammu and Kashmir has gone up rather than well, it has down. Gone down elsewhere. Elsewhere, essentially in the governance discourse when you talk. So 
what this book is trying to do, argue or, or look into is that how uh, given the context it outlays the context of the governance in Kashmir and that context obviously is determined by it is the conflict the external dimension of the conflict which involves India Pakistan UN and then you have the internal dimension of it which involves the center and states relation the conflict between center and the state when within the regions conflict of special status other things then you have the financial the issues, financial constraints that the state faces uh, and, and the whole progress that has happened over a period of time. So given that context in which we live or in which we, the state, we, we operate, it tries to look that how state, the central government, as along with its state governments, the, what, you call, what has been termed by Sumantra Trabos and others as client governments, how they have evolved the strategies, policies, instruments in order to deal with that conflict situation or to deal with it to create that order in disorder and how those policies have unfolded and what are the outcome of the, the outcome of those policies and strategies and this book argues actually that because of the fact that these strategies, these policies, these instruments were mostly uh, evolved or, 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 or this was shaped, constructed by the state uh, uh, without any consideration to the popular sentiments or, or without taking people along with them. These have been sort of a, a, a you know, devised by state governments in isolation to the realities of the ground or, or taking people into consideration. These have mostly generated, uh, you know, uh, results which were unintended or in a way negative results than, were, than what was intended by these policies. In a way making this Kashmir what you call as a smoldering volcano that ultimately erupted in 1989-90. So that's the crux of this book and it tries to look at how uh, different governments in different phases how they have dealt with their given context, the problems that evolved during those periods and how they have tried to respond to those issues. So uh, one thing about this book is that I've tried to deal with this whole issue chronologically. Uh, I'm, I'm outlining the context, the whole context in which the governance operates uh, right from 47, what happened and, and in which context the governments had to operate. And then I'm trying to deal with each government separately up to 89. This book is up to 89, 47 to 89. So it deals with the first phase of, of Sheikh Abdullah's first government, that how, what, what were the policies that were taken, it talks about the land reforms, it talks about uh, unintended consequences of land reforms, what ha how, how far they were radical or how far they benefited actually people and in a way it has taken it has revisited the shape of Dilla and his policies uh, that how his how, how his policy of going with India actually uh, in a way later on he tried he was trying to revisit that he was trying to relook at that and and that policy led to his dismissal later on uh, it talks about that while land reforms uh, did happen and which was very radical land reforms but it argues that during shape of class period and first phase it actually did not benefit peasants the way it, it, should. Was, it should have or it, it is often you know taken at, at its face value because of the fact that Sheikh Abdullah uh, while he, he, he exceeded with India but he had a very strong independent mind set he wanted to be a you know the promises that were made to him as as a greater autonomy, he made to, wanted to maintain that autonomy, and for that autonomy, he realized that self-sufficiency is uh, very important, you know, uh, and that self-sufficiency actually led to the excessive taxation on the peasants, and peasants had nothing actually to offer. So that is why you will find that mujwas and other things he couldn't abolish them. While he gave peasants the land, he took more than what what he gave them. So. So, so he tries to look into those policies that how policy of those uh, nationalization, uh, other things and how, uh, you know, the Nayab Kashmir manifesto that he tried to implement, how it created resentment in, in, in other communities or other things. So it, it, it in a way, uh, while uh, looking at each government, it tries both things. It tries to highlight their, the, 
their policies, positive steps that they took for the developments. And then it also talks about what were the problems during those those, those regimes, like in Sheikh Hubla's case, about the political crisis that had happened, crushing the opposition, uh, democracy, what happened with the democracy and other things. And similarly, it moves to Bakshi's period and it talks about his poli economic policies, liberalized, liberalized economic policies. Uh, and it was in Bakshi's time that the benefits of land reforms were given, were, were reaped by the peasantry because he made he abolished mujwas, he got tremendous you know flow of aid and 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 rice etc from Indian state. So 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 and then the agricultural policies, irrigation facilities that he and, and then the, the he launched about what you call it the cultural project. Uh, Jashni Nisha, Jashni Shalimar, because he had to wean people not only from the idea of independence of Pakistan but also from Sheikh Abdullah. Uh, so, and then obviously, uh, then his failed policies, the negative policies that happened with democracy, and, uh, and corruption, and other things. Uh, so, so every phase has been given its own due place, and, and similarly in, in Sadiq's time socialist policy that he tried to that how he tried to go for liberalization but because of the, the constant conflict and tensions that you had in state he couldn't that liberalization was very limited and he had to revert back to the you know rigging of elections or crashing of opposition because plebiscite movement was becoming very strong students movements were rising at that point of time etc so so every phase is talked in its own uh, up to 89 and tries to look into the policies uh, and, and strategies and, and steps that different governments have taken and what was the outcome of those steps. I believe that, uh, you know, worst phase is, uh, I don't know how we define the worst phase of government because there were certain things uh, that you feel in this whole process which Certain things that remain constant, certain things change very slowly, and certain things change very fast, which created its own problems in each phase. So, say, for example, the conflict remained constant, both internal and external conflict. Uh, denial of democracy, you know, that remained constant. Suppressing of opposition remained constant. You know, freedom of freedom of press and other things, suppressing these things that remain constant. Uh, there was a gradual change uh, as far as you know certain liberal policies state aid uh, development say for example and certain things changed constant very fast say for example education spread very fast creating its own problems uh, so there were only we can say the dormant phases certain bit of dormant phase and uprisings so you had Obviously, 47 48 period, very, very tough period to deal with. There were tremendous problems that Sheikh Abdullah government had to face. That, that's something that we must recognize with each phase. Uh, Bakshi's phase, by and large, was, was, was you know, more about economic development. That's why we call him Bakshi the builder. So it was where people were more into themselves. Uh, but those things continued operation, etc. If you look at the Sadiq's phase, Sadiq's phase was very, very, you know, full of turmoil. Yeah. Turmoil in the sense that you had uh, students' movement, tremendous students' movements we see during that period of time. Pelibisic movement was not uh, Even the Pandit agitation, the Pandit community was up in arms because we really believe that governments are facing, you know, following a socialist policies where they are more benefiting the Muslim community rather than the benefiting every community equally. So that was a very tough phase. You had 65 war, Razakars had come, so everything was happening. So it was again a very tough phase. And later on, uh, uh, when Sheikh Abdullah's second phase came, uh, it was a sort of a more a silent phase for some period of time before it actually erupted. But underneath this whole process, you will find always that disturbance uh, or that was always there. But it was only the phases of it's it's you know it's it's uh, what you can call as as its uh, uh, velocity or or, or or its intensity remained sometimes dormant and while it's at other places at other times as soon as environment provided certain you know, environment was there 
it erupted and same happened after the 1989 75 phase 75 to 75 to you know 86 phase was something where it was you know something as as if everything has come back to the peace uh, but that was not actually the case that current beneath it was always going there so that's why you will find many scholars arguing that there were two Kashmiris during this phase you had a Kashmir which was bustling which was uh, economic activities were going on everything was going on then you had another Kashmir where you know all of a sudden there is a hartal all of a sudden there are certain things happening or that that underneath that current was going on and that ultimately erupted because of the 87 election that we know so all of a sudden that bursted when the opportunity provided itself so uh, by and large uh, the governance structures have almost remained the same the problems have been varied but there are certain fundamental problems and obviously the Kashmir, issue of Kashmir that was always there it was only the cases of sometimes its intensity going down and at other point of time it coming up and that ultimately bursted in 1989. I think the uh, takeaway of the book is that uh, it provides a complete, it's a, it's a first, the first book of this nature which, which has delineated with governance and the, 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 the policy strategies of the governments, the governance process and its relation with the Kashmir, the political aspect of Kashmir uh, for the first time and in a very holistic manner. Uh, it has tried to use all variety of sources, uh, very comprehensive sources based from archive to secondary sources to groundwork and other things. Uh, and try to deal with each phase in its own context. So uh, it's a book for researchers, it's a book for the lay man whoever is interested in knowing what actually happened in Kashmir after 47 and what ultimately led to 1989 crisis. So if you want uh, 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 an economist who wants to know what are the policies programs that were carried out in different regions of Jammu and Kashmir during this period have tried to deal with this. If an historian tries to look for the history of how it has unfolded, a political scientist tries to look or a general reader wants to know the history, politics, economics of Jammu and Kashmir state after 47 and and, and what actually went wrong and, and, and how different governments at different points of time try to deal with the issues and what were the results of those policy strategies that they adopted this is i think the book tries to say in its own limited way i try to deal with that issue so it is a sort of a, 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 a revisit to the history a revisit to the past uh, in a comprehensive manner and try to give in under one cover trying to bring all these aspects of governance in one 